You are listening to Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board. Hello and welcome to another in the series of Off the Shelf podcasts. We look to bring great thought leaders and great new books to your attention, and thank you for joining us on this podcast. I'm Rebecca Ray, and I have the privilege of leading the Human Capital Center here at the Conference Board. And I have the real pleasure of being here today with John Hagel, who is the author of a brand new book that just came out last week on the journey beyond fear. John, welcome, and thank you for joining me. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Absolutely. You know, I think there's no end to the number of things we can point to in the last year and a half that have unsettled us on many different levels, from a global economic crisis to a pandemic that's worldwide, to social unrest, to, to even some of the, the fears that we have on a, on a personal level about food security or job security or the health and safety of people we love. You know, this, this has to be the backdrop against which a book that helps you think about overcoming fears. Tell me more about this and, and what prompted you to write this book? Yeah, so actually, I, there were two catalysts for the book. One is uh, throughout most of my career, I've been uh, a business strategist, and I was taught to believe that strategy is everything. If you have the right strategy, you win. And over the years, I've come to believe that it's actually more about psychology rather than strategy. That if we don't understand the emotions that are shaping our choices and actions, the best strategy just sits on a shelf somewhere. And the second catalyst uh, related to that, and I actually started writing the book three years ago, so well before wow. the current pandemic. And I travel around the world as part of my work, and I, I was struck that everywhere I went, the dominant emotion that I was encountering at the highest levels of organizations, lowest levels out in the community was fear. And while I think the fear is understandable, I think it's also very limiting. And so it's what prompted me to write a book to help us on the journey beyond fear. So John, probably there's been few books that are more timely, <laughs> but <laughs> so, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what creates that fear. I mentioned a few things at the, the top of the podcast, but from your perspective, can you articulate for us the, the, the global convergence of the different forces that are creating this kind of fear. And maybe and maybe this fear is at a different level or somewhat different from the ways in which we may have been fearful in the past. Yes, I think uh, it's based on the research that I've been doing um, for a couple of decades now on something that I call the big shift. I believe we're in the early stages of a profound transformation of the global economy and society. And it's driven by long-term forces They've been already at play for almost a decade, but I believe we're still in the early stages. And ultimately, the result of of these forces is mounting performance pressure on all of us. And it takes many different forms. I think one of the forms of pressure is just intensifying competition. You know, increasingly, workers around the world are fearful that they're going to lose their jobs because the robots are going to take my job. And so competition, not just from other people, but from technology. And then you've got the accelerating pace of change where the things you thought you could count on are no longer there. And then on top of all that, because of the connectivity we've created on a global scale, small events in some faraway place in the world cascade into extreme events that disrupt our best laid plans. Dare I say pandemic. And so I think that those, the combination of intensifying competition, accelerating pace of change, and then extreme disruptive events, it's very understandable why more and more people are feeling fear. That's a scary world that we're heading into. You know, John, let's talk for a moment more uh, about the accelerating pace of technology and the impact. I mean, I know from all the years where you were leading the Center from the Edge at Deloitte. Talk to me about the palpable fear that people have about being replaced or at least becoming redundant or irrelevant. Yes, no, I, I think it's certainly an um, increasingly widespread fear, not just among you know manual laborers, but what so-called knowledge workers. I mean, I think that the challenge is 
and I'm going to generalize here, but I think it's broadly the case, the work that we do in most large institutions consists of tightly specified tasks, highly standardized and tightly integrated. That's what work is for most of us, whether we're sitting at a desk or out in a factory somewhere. And if that's what work is, tightly specified, highly standardized, tightly integrated, software and the machines can do that so much more effectively than humans can. And I actually gave a talk about five years ago where I, the, the title was How Robots Can Restore Our Humanity, because I actually believe that's good. Let the machines take that kind of work. I don't believe we as humans were ever meant to do that kind of work. Now it frees us up. If we see the opportunity, and that's the problem is with fear, you tend to just focus on the threat. But if you see the opportunity, now we can redefine work in ways that are much more stimulating and challenging for humans. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe this is going to lead us into a world where we actually have much more fulfilling work. Well, one can only hope, but I, I do think that it has massive implications for leaders, right? So you have to to lead in a in a world where you are sometimes disintermediated by technology. But some of the work that we've done, uh, that which we, we see in the marketplace, talks a lot about the need for empathetic leaders, and they need to have a whole different skill set uh, in order to, to be of value in this new world that we're in. Yes. No, I, I think that, again, one of the key messages in the book is that we, we need to focus on the emotions of people that we're working with, whether we're leaders or just working in, in, in the front lines, it's understanding the emotions of the people around us and then being able to shape those in ways that will help us to achieve more impact. So I think that it's, it's critical for leaders to address this. I think, unfortunately, I, I think we are still in a state of denial about fear even though certainly in the pandemic, everybody has a sense there's more fear, but the, the sense that I get is, well, okay, but the pandemic's going to go away. And once it goes away, that fear will be gone. My message is, no, this is, a, this is a much more fundamental and sustaining fear, and we need to address it if we're going to make uh, have the kind of performance impact that we need. Because I think fear is very limiting, ultimately, in terms of the ability to have impact it increases resistance to change. And so in a world that's more rapidly changing, if you're resisting change, good luck. So the, the challenge is how can we cultivate hope and excitement, emotions that will help us to move beyond fear. And by the way, I, I'm not in any way suggesting that fear is going to go away, that we're going to eliminate fear. No, I believe it's, it's there because there are some fundamental forces, but that there are emotions that can help us to move in spite of fear and achieve the impact that's more meaningful to us. In that context, I will say too, <laughs> I talked about the big shift creating mounting performance pressure. At the same time, the big shift, the same forces are creating exponentially expanding opportunity. We can create so much more value with far less resources far more quickly than would have been imaginable a decade or two ago. But the challenge is if we're driven by fear, we don't even see those opportunities, much less address them. We're consumed by the threat, by the pressure. And so, again, I think there's, there's more and more reason to want to help people cultivate other emotions that will help them to see the opportunity and pursue the opportunities. Yeah, I want to, I want to come back to some of those emotions. I agree with you. If you're in a place of fear, you're not going to be bringing your best thoughts um, and your best rational thinking to, to any situation you find yourself in. I, I can only imagine this book really becomes so relevant for business leaders. And, you know, as I think about them, and I think certainly this last year and a half in particular, although, you know, this is not the only time in human history we've been under pressure, but this has been a tough time for leaders who've had to put their own 
you know, mask on first before helping others, mm. as we used to, to do in an airplane. And, you know, they've got to help employees move beyond fear, right? So, yes, there's fear, and we all know the Maslow's hierarchy needs, and, you know, we, we, we know how that plays itself out. But what can business leaders do to help people move beyond the fear that they may be experiencing? Ah, no, it's a it's a great question. It's a key focus in the book. I think there are many elements that uh, approaches that leaders can adopt. There's there's one which is something that I've come to call zoom out, zoom in, and it emerged by looking. I've worked with some of the most successful tech companies here in Silicon Valley, and they have an approach to strategy that I call zoom out, zoom in, and broadly it focuses on two time horizons. One time horizon is 10 to 20 years from now. And the focus there is what's a really big, inspiring opportunity that we could address that's going to emerge within the next 10 to 20 years. Then the other side, zoom in, is 6 to 12 months. And the focus there is what few actions, two or three actions, can we take in the next 6 to 12 months that will have the greatest impact in accelerating our movement towards that longer term opportunity. And when I originally came across this, I thought about it in classic strategy terms, but over time I've come to realize, no, this is very powerful in shaping emotions. If you can frame a really inspiring, exciting opportunity out in the future, and draw people out into the future versus just getting consumed by what's going on at the moment, now you start to build some excitement and hope. And when you combine that with the zoom in, the short-term initiatives that start to show real impact, you overcome a lot of the fear and skepticism that many of the employees are going to have that, oh, come on, that's, that's just a fantasy, that opportunity. No, we're actually making some progress today towards that opportunity. It builds more excitement about the opportunity and willingness to come on board. So I think that that can be one way to really help move people from fear to hope and excitement. I'll just another quick advice for leaders is I think we're going to have to have a fundamental shift in the leadership model in the institutions we have today. And I get generalize again, the mark of a strong leader is someone who has an answer to all the questions. No matter what question, you can count on the leader to have an answer. And by the way, if they don't have an answer, Maybe it's time to get rid of them and find somebody who does. My view is in this world we're heading into, this big shift world we're heading into, the mark of a strong leader is the one who has the most powerful questions and inspiring questions about really big opportunities and will freely admit they don't have an answer and ask for help. And it sends a message to everyone in the organization, it's okay to ask questions and to ask, ask for help. And a lot of the fear I think that people have is they feel very isolated and they don't feel they can ask for help because that's a sign of weakness. But if our leaders are asking for help, oh, and about something really inspiring, wow, let's see if we can address that. So I think that can be a very strong way of overcoming fear and building excitement in the organization. Well, you know, John, I, I agree with you. I mean, every leader needs to articulate a vision, right? And that's always been the hallmark of a, of a leader. And I think especially now, to your point, they have to build out um, enough faith and optimism that people feel as though they can reach that vision and that that leader is the, is the one they can trust to take them there, right? So, yeah, I think, I, I think that's so vitally important now because I think it is easy for people to feel isolated and to feel as though the problems are so big they can't they can't begin to to address them. You know, we're going to take a short break, John, and I want to I want to come back in a moment and and talk a little bit about um, you you talk about passion a lot in the book, and I want to talk about passion and how you see that in a business context. So uh, let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Interested in this content? You can find this and much more at our Conference Board website, www.conference-board.org. Or even better, contact our membership team and your company can enjoy the benefits of our in-depth research around the economy, environmental, social, and governance issues, 
public policy, marketing and communications, and human capital. As a member of the conference board, you will be able to have full access to all of our cutting edge research, leading indicators, benchmarking and data services, in addition to webcasts and podcasts such as the one you are enjoying now. Well, welcome back to this Off the Shelf podcast. I'm here with John Hagel, who is a best-selling author and uh, the author of a brand new book called The Journey Beyond Fear. So John, a few minutes ago, we talked a little bit about fear and how it can be debilitating and what leaders need to do. I'd love you to spend a little bit of time here talking about passion and how that plays itself out into the kinds of leaders we need now. Can you speak to that? Sure. Passion is a key central theme in, in my book. It's one of the three pillars in the journey beyond fear. But I use the term with some uh, ambivalence because everybody has a different definition of passion. So uh, I have to be careful to be clear about what I mean by it. <clears throat> and I'm focused, and this emerged from research that I've been doing, around a specific form of passion that I call the passion of the explorer. And I found this passion by looking at environments where there is sustained extreme performance improvement. And so what can we learn from those environments? And one of the things I found was that everyone in those environments, all the participants in those environments, had this very specific form of passion. And it has three elements to it. The first element is just they all have a long-term commitment to having an increasing impact in whatever domain they're excited about. So it's, they're there for the long term and more and more impact. Second element is what I call a questing disposition. When confronted with an unexpected challenge, these people get excited. This is an opportunity for them to learn how to have more impact. So they're excited by these challenges, not fearful or threatened by them. And then finally, the third element is a connecting disposition. Their reaction when confronted with these unexpected challenges is, who else can I connect with who can help me get to a better answer faster? And so when you combine these three elements, this notion of commitment to increasing impact, excitement about challenges, connecting with others, you've got people who are driven to have more and more impact. And I think it, my view is, again, in a big shift world of increasing pressure, everyone in the organization needs to have this form of passion about their work, not just the leaders, but everybody, and not just in research centers or innovation centers, everyone, janitors, people in procurement, people out in the maintenance operations, if they don't have this passion, they're not going to increase their learning and impact as rapidly as they need to. And the challenge is, again, based on the research that I did, I ended up doing a survey of the U.S. workforce, the entire workforce in the U.S. And my, my best estimate is that at most 14% of U.S. workers have this form of passion about their work. 86% do not have it. That's a huge gap. And I think it's, again, something that I don't see enough leaders focused on. We're all focused on worker engagement and we have, all have metrics of, you know, how engaged our workers are, which is fine. How about taking it to the next step and asking who, who has passion about their work and how can we increase that passion? Because if we don't increase the passion, we're not going to have people who are driven to have more and more impact and excited about having more and more impact. So, so you know, John, you talk about engagement, and, and this is a, a, an area I'm pretty passionate about, no pun intended, um, <laughs> because we know the value of engagement, whether it's, you know, quantified in quite the right, right way or, you know, some people can go back and forth on what engagement really is and all that. But I would be prepared to argue and defend the premise that if someone is more engaged, in other words, they feel more connected to the mission and purpose and feel as though that what they do has impact, that there's a higher level of discretionary effort or at least a, a series of, of perhaps tangible business outcomes that one could point to. So can you, for our listeners, sort of articulate the difference in your mind between engagement and passion? Wow. Wow. <laughs> 
Yeah, again, it's a challenge because, as you said, everybody's got different definitions of engagement. So broadly, I would say the, the research that I've seen definitely shows that engaged workers perform at a higher level than unengaged workers. So there's a, a big increase in performance when, you, when you're engaged. The challenge is I don't see anything that measures the progress over time of those engaged workers. Are they increasing performance more and more over time? And by the way, it's accelerating performance improvement, not just increasing incrementally your performance. And to me, that's something, again, that the passionate workers focus on. They're driven to get to higher and higher levels of impact. They're very unhappy. In fact, I, I find that in the surveys I've done, passionate workers are often unhappy and frustrated because they see all the potential and they see all the obstacles and barriers that are in their way to get to that potential. And so they're driven to do whatever they can to overcome those obstacles and barriers. But what excites them is having more and more impact over time and again, in a rapidly changing world with mounting pressure, if we're not accelerating our impact, we're going to fall farther behind. So, John, if if 14 percent of, of the folks that that you've surveyed or researched are indeed passionate, their job is to push the 86 percent along with them, a lot like Sisyphus trying to push the rock up the hill. So. <laughs> You know what's what's the way we can we can get at it? You know, your book talks a lot about lifelong learning, and it also talks about you know the the passion of the explorer. Can you share more about some of the the concepts around those two things? Sure. No, I, again, I think in, in the business world today, everybody's talking about lifelong learning. We all recognize the world's changing at a more and more rapid rate, and we have to engage in lifelong learning. What strikes me is that whenever I hear leaders talking about lifelong learning, they never talk about the motivation. Why? That requires a huge amount of effort, takes a lot of risk. Why would people do that? And if I press them on it, again, I'm generalizing, but if I press them on it, the answer I get back is, well, fear. They're going to do it because of fear. If they don't do lifelong learning, they're going to lose their jobs. So get with it. Start learning. And again, while I believe fear can motivate some, some limited learning, it's not going to motivate the, the robust learning and the accelerated learning that we need over time to really be successful. And I should say, too, when, when I talk about learning here, again, there's a, a question of semantics and definitions. When I press on learning in, in most organizations, the, the response I get is, oh, we do learning. We have training programs. You know, we take workers, they can go through all, through all these kinds of training programs. To me, training programs are about sharing existing knowledge. You have a teacher who's teaching you something that's already known. And not to dismiss that, certainly that's valuable and important. But in a world of accelerating change, what we know already is, is becoming obsolete at an accelerating rate. And so the learning that I'm focused on and that I think lifelong learning should be focused on is learning in the form of creating new knowledge. And that does not occur in a training room. That occurs in the workplace by people acting and confronting unexpected situations and learning about what's required to have more and more impact in those situations that have never been encountered before. And I think that, again, it ties back to the passion of the explorer, people who have this form of passion are excited about that learning. They're driven to learn and learn faster and faster, not just learn at a linear rate. They're, that's, that's what excites them and motivates them. So I think that's the motivation that we need to cultivate for people to really engage in lifelong learning. Yeah. You know, I think lifelong learning requires, to your point, a commitment because it's a very different from compliance. You, know, you can get people to go through training because it's required by the SEC or the, you know what I mean? And, and, or as a condition of employment or continued employment, and that's great. But that's very, very different from somebody who reads, you know, innovative things on their own time or sets up a, 
a learning experience, you know, in as part of their uh, contribution or doesn't begin to count the hours that they spend trying to understand or wrap their head around something. That's that comes from a, a passionate commitment, not a, oh, my gosh, I, I have to do this because otherwise I'll mm. be in trouble with the chief compliance officer. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, fear can be a motivator, but I don't think it's the best tool you have in the toolbox. Right. Not at all. So, John, I'm, I probably could talk about this for a very long time with you because we have a lot of shared interests and passions. But I, I do want to get to a couple of things here before our, our podcast is over. So talk to me about these impact groups um, and, and, and how do they drive business performance? Sure. Again, this comes from research that I've done looking at uh, companies and where, where we see accelerating performance improvement. And what I found was that in those areas of accelerating performance improvement, the workers are coming together into small groups. Uh, I call them impact groups. They're typically between three to at most 15 people, and they're tightly connected. They have deep trust-based relationships with each other, and they share a commitment to having more and more impact. And at one level, they're supporting each other, you know, if they get frustrated or lose hope. But on the other side, they're challenging each other, constantly challenging to say, how can we get to even more impact over time? But they're challenging with respect. I call it productive friction. And I think that's critical to learning faster. I, I say that no matter how smart any one individual is, they're going to learn a lot faster as part of a small group that shares a commitment having more and more impact. You know, uh, I think that goes back to your earlier point also, John, about uh, getting beyond your fear. If you feel as though uh, you are making progress, you are making a tangible impact. And that to me seems like you found a support group, if you will, for overcoming the fear, making an impact, uh, supporting each other through that sort of becomes a self-reinforcing loop, I would think. Absolutely. No, it ties very much back to the emotions and fear and hope and excitement. I, I've, I've come to see that these small groups can be very powerful in amplifying the energy and excitement uh, that's shared among the participants and reducing the fear. I mean, if, if one of the problems with fear is it becomes a vicious cycle. The more afraid I become, the more isolated I become. And the more isolated I am, the more afraid I become. And so you get this vicious cycle versus, no, I'm connecting with people who share my excitement and are working with me, supporting me in doing something that's really meaningful. That's wonderful. I, you know, I, I think all of us need, perhaps now more than ever, uh, to find supportive people who can help you become what you need to become and help you accomplish what you need to accomplish. And uh, realizing that others are feeling that same way. I, I loved your point earlier about leaders feeling comfortable asking for help. And I think that's going to be vitally important as we brace for what I think is one of the lasting outcomes, at least short term of the COVID uh, crisis, which is uh, a mental health uh, tsunami. And so some of the research uh, that we do indicates that a lot of people do feel comfortable speaking up uh, in, in the workplace and largely because they trust their managers, which I think is, is a great, is a great finding, you know? So you know, you, you talk a lot about a learning platform. And when you talk about platforms, you're not talking about social media platforms, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Most of everybody talks about platforms. Again, it's a word that everyone uses. They're typically talking about aggregation platforms, short-term transactions, buying and selling things, or uh, social platforms where it's just about building relationships with others, that you, friends and family. I'm talking about a different form of platform that I believe has not yet been really addressed, which is learning platforms. And again, here the focus is learning in the form of creating new knowledge by acting together uh, and achieving more impact. And having that as the primary design of the platform, how can we help participants to learn faster together by acting together? And it starts a core unit of the platform is this notion of impact groups. So helping people come together into small impact groups where they can form deep trust-based relationships with each other, but then connecting into broader networks where they can ask questions and, 
uh, learn from others in terms of what what challenges they're facing. So I think it's an untapped opportunity. I believe it's the next wave of platforms for sure. Well, thank you, John, for that. I do think we are in a rapidly shifting, evolving scenario where hopefully people will be able to pick up your book and move closer towards some of these goals for success and to to overcome the fear that they have. John, you know, in preparation for these podcasts, it's always a privilege to talk to people who are, you know, trying to advance the conversation and, and help people with real uh, tangible um, steps. And I, I thank you for sharing this. And, you know, I try to prepare questions or prepare ideas, but sometimes I miss uh, asking the perfect question that you wanted to to have me ask so that, so that you could, could share more. Is there anything that we haven't covered today that you want to make sure our listeners uh, know about? Wow. Well, I think uh, we've talked mostly about uh, the implications for business, which is certainly a key, key aspect or dimension of the book. But the book is much broader in terms of addressing our, our lives and the way we live our lives outside of work as well. And I think that we all face that need to, first of all, acknowledge fear. I think one of the challenges we have is where we live in cultures where expressing fear is a sign of weakness. So mm-hmm. many of us are not even willing to acknowledge to ourselves that we're afraid, much less share that with anyone else. And so I think that the, the whole focus of the book is to say, hey, it's understandable. There are reasons for fear, but we need to commit to a journey beyond fear and do that in our personal lives and work lives in all aspects of our existence. So that's the focus of the book. Well, terrific. John, uh, thank you so much for joining me. I hope folks will pick up a copy of your brand new book, The Journey Beyond Fear, which I know is available on Amazon and and other outlets as well. Um, I wish you great success with this. And I want to thank you very much for joining me today and uh, and sharing some of the insights here. Well, I very much appreciate your interest. Thank you. Of course. And to all of our listeners, I hope you'll subscribe to the entire Off the Shelf podcast series. And uh, we have uh, many wonderful uh, podcasts uh, on demand. And I hope if you've missed a couple that you'll go back and pick them up. So I'll uh, sign off for this session. And thank you for listening. And thank you for joining us here at the conference board. This has been Off the Shelf, a podcast by The Conference Board.